What's going on, guys? It's your boy Coop here. Of course, the combat consultant, the soundboard god. Can't roll with the Jewish Shala anymore because it's caused a little bit of a rift, a fracture in the industry that I currently work in. So I had to kind of retire that nickname in the rafters. Nonetheless, we do have to get into my UFC 284 picks because after taking a closer look at the lineup, I do believe it to be a very underrated card. What I'm going to do, though, to spare you guys some time and keep this video as quick as possible is I'm going to put two minutes on the clock for each matchup. And at the end of the two minutes, I have to give my pick and my prediction for how the fight is going to play out. So it's going to have to be pretty quick analysis. But let's get into it now. I'm going to put time on the clock right around let me get my notes going now so we've got jimmy crute versus alonzo manyfield uh this is going to be a very fun one man alonzo is a guy he's 35 now but he's always athletic he's always dangerous at the beginning of fights he's a quick starter and he's gotten a lot of guys out of there extremely quickly the experience advantage goes to the way of crute he's been in there with paul craig he actually finished Paul Craig, he's been in there with the current champ, Jamal Hill, Anthony Smith, Anthony Smith, and Jamal Hill both finished him, but I do think as though having that experience will give him a little bit of leeway when he comes down to a guy at Alonzo Menifield's level. Not saying that Menifield is not a talented fighter, he's 13-3, and that's a pretty good record when you consider Jimmy Crute's record is 12-3, and but he is 35, so he's not going to be making a run at the title anytime soon, so he's not title contention level, and I just think that for what it's worth, Kroot is going to have that experience advantage. The only thing he can't do is get wild. I noticed that even with some of the higher level competition, Jimmy Kroot has this thing about him for some reason where he loves to get wild. His real bread and butter is staying on the outside. He has great kicks, fluid boxing. Uh, he, he just all around is a very technical fighter. He's got a great jujitsu game, uh, but he tends to get sucked into these dog fights. And I don't for the life of me know why he does this. He is the far more technical fighter than a lot of the guys he steps in there with, but for whatever reason, he just throws all caution to the win. So I think the key in this one is gonna be the early goings on in this fight. I think if Manyfield can make this a scrappy early affair, a brawl as he usually does, you see some of the shots that he lands has guys absolutely flatlined. If he can get to Jimmy Crute early and get him on the back foot and get Crute to make a mistake, get a little bit more wild, I don't see any reason why we can't see, and this is my official pick, and Alonzo Medifield, early finish. Maybe that's going against the green. That's my hot pick for the video. Let's get into the next one. Woo! See that? See that? I'm good at this shit, man. I'm good at this shit. Okay. Next up, we got Justin Taffa, Parker Porter. This is an interesting one, man, because Parker Porter's kind of middle of the road, but he mixes together his wrestling and his striking really well. That's his strong point, right? He's uh, got very great cardio for a big man. The longer the fight goes, the better it favors Porter. That's what I've tended to notice. He has really good head movement. He's great in the clinch, but he's going in there with Justin Taffa. Justin Taffa has fantastic power, fluid boxing, great counter punching. The only time where Justin Taffa tends to leave himself exposed, where he tends to get a little bit too dicey and too kind of out and ahead of himself is when he gets emotional. There was a fight that I watched that he had with Jorgen DeCastro. Jorgen DeCastro caught him with some good shots and he rushed in because he was getting more emotional, got clipped, and it created one of the greatest UFC knockouts of all time. But when he is calculated, when he is sharp with his punches, when he's short with them, he is, oof, one of the scariest guys in the heavyweight division to go up against. I mean, he's got power for days right? He just cannot afford in this fight to go back to his old ways. I think if you want to talk about getting into a scrappier type of affair with a guy like Parker Porter, it needs to be calculated because Porter can kind of stay. And I've noticed this sometimes with other guys that have fought Taffa, other guys that, that mix up their boxing, their wrestling really well and stay on the outside can kind of just outpoint him. And Taffa gets more emotional and he's not really throwing, and the com commentators, when I watched the fight, made a great point of this. They're, he's not thinking tactically. He's thinking of, how do I get to this guy? How do I knock him spark out? Uh, I do think, however, that with Porter's skill level, I, I don't know. I, I don't think he has the power to hold off Taffa, and I honestly think that we're going to see a reined-in Taffa get the early win by TKO because he's going to be a lot more kind of 
he's going to be a lot more calculated this fight. And so I see an early finish for Justin Taffa. Put in the pick. We're moving on fantastically here right on time. Hold on. I got to get my notes ready. I got to get my notes ready. Trying to make this as fast as possible for you guys. We have got Jack Della Maddalena versus Randy Rude Boy Brown. My dark horse pick for a potential fight of the night uh, candidate here. Man, both guys, fantastic counter punchers. Uh, Randy Brown, really, really tall for the division. He's six foot three. But uh, both these guys possess extreme talents. Both have passed uh, their ground game tests. Jack Della Maddalena, respectively, with Ramazan Amiv, and then Randy Brown with a friend of the show and friend of mine, Mickey Gall. And Mickey Gall is a savage on the ground. And, and Randy Brown did a really good job in that fight of just kind of slipping back into guard, getting out the back door at times. So this, I, I, while well, I don't suspect that this fight's going to be taken to the ground, I do think that if these two gentlemen were to want to take it to the ground, that aspect in both of their games would be there for them. But I want to talk about the stand-up. Because Brandy Brown, I believe, has better kicks. Right? Jack is much more of the physical type of guy. He likes to wait in the pocket. He's got quick hands. He likes to use his pull counters. And he's got power. And that's how he usually likes to get guys out of there. He'll draw them in. Guys that are more aggressive, he'll let them come in. And he slips. Boom. And he comes over the top of the big shot. Or it could be a straight down the pipe, one, two, whatever it is. Doesn't matter. Point is, he's slick. Right? So I think where this fight will be decided, and I usually say this, it's funny, I, I usually say the other way around is, oh, you know, if a guy can control the center of the octagon first, he can set the pace, he can set the tempo, he can win this fight. With this bout, I, I honestly think we have to reverse that theory in our heads. We have to reverse this idea right, of the guy who is more aggressive taking the earlier rounds and, and maybe even getting a KO and winning. I think it's about who can get, who can play possum the best, who can get the other guy to come in, overextend themselves, and look for those counter shots. So expect to see a technical affair. I want to say Madalena is going to take this. I got five seconds left here just because I think that Randy Brown has a tendency sometimes to play more aggressive, and I think that's going to play right into Madalena's plan. Madalena by early uh, TKO or decision. We've got Yair Rodriguez versus Josh Emmett in the co-main event of the evening for the interim featherweight world championship. Uh, the winner is set to face either, I guess, Islam or Volk, whoever has the belt at the end of the main event fight. Either way, this is going to be a fun one. Yair, one of my favorite fighters personally, just because of his uh, his Taekwondo background, the way that he kicks, the way that he strikes. Just a fun guy to watch, man. Young, a wealth of experience. He's been in there with some absolute killers. He's athletic. He's got unorthodox striking timing with the way that he throws. He can expend a lot less energy throwing kicks up there. I saw Dan Hardy talking about it in his breakdown. He put it perfectly in that sense. So he's dangerous everywhere. But I think where he's most dangerous and where he's going to be most dangerous in this fight is out at range. He cannot allow himself to stay in the pocket and get hit by that big right by Josh Emmett. And I want to say like I'm stealing Dan Hardy's take because Dan and I tend to agree on a lot of different things. Uh, but I, I I just think that Yair cannot, he really, I and mean, I've noticed he t tends to fight this fight a lot now where, and I don't necessarily agree with Dan Hardy when he says he feels like he has to prove himself. I think it's just that he's kind of become a lot more flat-footed and has stayed in the pocket. You want to look at back at his, you know, Max Holloway fight. You could see that he'll stay a lot more flat-footed, kind of more in a boxing stance, and he trades with guys in close. I think his bread and butter was always staying at range and utilizing those weird types of techniques that you get from Taekwondo to catch his opponents off guard. I don't think his bread and butter this fight should be to try to sit there and trade with Josh Emmett. Josh Emmett could put the lights out on anyone. And Josh Emmett hasn't faced the same level of experience, albeit that Yair has. Uh, but really, we, we all know what he's looking for. I think also for what it's worth, uh, if this fight goes to the ground, Josh Emmett would have a really big advantage there because not a lot of people know he is actually a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu blue belt. And a lot of people know about his wrestling experience. So I've got this for Emmett by finish. I think that's the way this fight's going to end. That is if Yair stays in the pocket with him. If Yair stays on the outside, I don't even know what type of fight we're going to see, but it's going to be a fun one. All right. And for the main event, Islam versus Volk. Here we go. Now, I don't think the the weight discrepancy is going to play as big of an effect or a factor as many people are, are asserting. I just don't believe that to be the case. Volk has been north of 200 pounds before. I don't think that going up in a weight class, where, by the way, he's competed at before the UFC, is going to bother him all that much. I don't also think that the height is going to play that much of a factor. 
Volk is used to fighting taller guys. That's why he has such a great boxing game is he needs to be able to have that fluidity of his footwork, that timing, those shots to get inside on guys. You saw the way he dismantled Max Holloway their last fight. The real X factor or the real area where this fight will be contested is in those scrambles. And I think that his camp knows that. I'm talking about Volk's camp knows that because they've been drilling a lot of stand up and then guys will come in. Specifically, he's been training with Craig Jones, which is a he's a Brazilian jiu jitsu wizard. They'll train Volk standing up and then a guy coming in and trying to get, a, let's just say, like a double leg or a single leg on him. And Volk has to then kind of shake the guy off, right? And defend the takedown. And they'll do rounds and rounds and rounds of that. So they're working on Volk's cardio. They're working on his strength. And I, I, do think that that is where I think that's the correct plan, right? Because if you're Volk, you don't want Islam getting a hold of you. Volk has terrific defensive wrestling, and I don't want to take anything away from him there. But if, if Islam gets a hold of you and he's able to get you down, that's the fight. I'm just gonna say that straight up. That's the fight. A lot of these guys, you know, they like to make these things where it's like, oh yeah, Dagi standing guys around all the, you know, Armand Suzuki and did that. But listen, this Islam that we're seeing, you cannot let him get you to the ground. And so I think that's what the fight hinges on is, is how well can Volk scramble, how well can Volk uh, utilize his own striking. I think that Islam also has some really underappreciated and slept on striking of his own power for, in spades and, and the timing of that check hook that he throws is immaculate. So it's going to be a tough, tough fight for Volk. But I think if anyone will be able to get it done, it's him. However, I am a realist and I, I do believe that Islam... Uh, will unfortunately get this done and hold both divisions captive for years to come with his Dagestani style. But without further ado, that's been the episode for this week. Thank you guys so much. I have been your boy, Jacob Kuberman, the combat consultant, the soundboard god, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Deuces.